My name is Kim Brown, and I am the speaker coordinator hey. for the Oregon Mycological Society here in Portland, Oregon. Welcome to our June meeting. Um, it's unfortunate we can't meet in person, but we're doing the best that we can to provide the presentations and to see all of your faces kind of virtually. Um, just, a, uh, just a note, next month we will not have a meeting. We, the next meeting will be in August with Danny Miller and he'll be talking about his matchmaker program. So please join us for that. I uh, just want to put a big shout out here. Thank you to, uh, to Candace Palmer and to Leah Bendlin, who's going to be talking, um, telling us some updates on the group tonight. Candace is a big part of this. She's managing all the AV behind the scenes. So uh, definitely a big thank you for that. Um, Note, uh, most of you, well, all of you are seeing us out there on YouTube. So you'll note on the right-hand side, there's a chat function. You have to be logged into YouTube. So if you have Gmail, uh, please use that. Subscribe to the channel and log in, and you'll be able to chat and put your questions in there. And uh, with that, I'll be moderating. And so I'll be looking, uh, as the questions come up, please put them in there. And please, so that I can differentiate between that and the chat, put hashtag question, and then I'll be able to grab them, and then we'll uh, we'll talk with the speaker at the end of her presentation, get all of your answers, uh, all of your questions answered. Let's see, I'll compile the questions. And with that, uh, Leah has some updates on what's going on in the club, and uh, take it away, Leah. Okay, hello there. Um, can you see me okay? Um, all right, so I'm going to share my screen with you real quick. Share and screen. Look good? Not yet. Okay. Oh, there we go. How about now? Perfect. Okay. So I just wanted to give everybody some updates about what is going on um because of covid um lots of things have changed we haven't been able to meet in person we have a lot of um, people who are in vulnerable populations um so unfortunately we have to make a lot of cancellations and changes um spring camp as many people know was canceled um we are also canceling fall camp because there we just can't maintain social distance or if we could it would just be really logistically difficult um, we are canceling all in-person meetings um, for the rest of the year. Um, and we are canceling the fall show, unfortunately. Um, it's a bummer, but um, we really want to keep everybody safe. So even if, uh, e even if COVID restrictions are lifted and we're technically allowed to, we just want to make sure that everybody is staying safe and we're not responsible for anyone getting sick, you know? Um, so we have uh, switched to having a bunch of things online. Um, obviously, we're having the monthly meeting online. We're going to have all the same speakers doing their same presentations. Um, some of these are going to be hosted permanently on our YouTube channel that you're watching. And then some of them are going to be hosted on uh, our website um, in the near future. They're not up yet, but they will be in the members only section that we're going to have dedicated. Um, for, for that content. Um, we are also hoping to get some more content um, in addition to just the presentation so that you guys have some things to look forward to. Um, we already have some of that stuff up. I did a video a little while ago about the difference between burpas and half free morels, so check that out. Um, recently, uh, OMS board member Jenny Hauschult um, gave a presentation about citizen science and microflora projects. So check that one out. That one is on YouTube. Um, fall ID classes are going to be online. We don't know totally what this is going to look like yet, but it is in the works and ID classes are still going to happen. Um, we currently have and always have, or at least in the least recent past, have had um, social media pages on Facebook and Instagram and you can follow at uh, Oregon Mycological Society. We know that not everybody um, reads all of the emails and that's fine, but if you just want reminders about when the meetings are happening, happening um, that happens on Facebook and Instagram. 
Um, we are definitely open to putting more content on those pages. So if you are a member and you have some suggestions about things that you would like to see on those pages, please um, forward links to things, um, photos uh, out to social media, OMS at gmail.com and I'll give it a look and they might go up on, on the social media pages. So thank you for your contributions for that. Um, and what else is in the woods? So hopefully you've been able to get out and do some hunting in the woods. Um, Mount Hood did uh, reopen a little while back uh, on May 29th, with the exception of most campgrounds. A few campgrounds are open, for, but for the most part they're not, but uh, most of the regular stuff is open um, for people's use. Uh, Permits, uh, mushroom hunting permits, which you usually get at the ranger station. I don't think the ranger stations are open yet, but you can get permit. You don't need permits for now. They're waiving that uh, until September 7th. Um, you are required to have a digital or printed copy of the map, which you can get on the Mount Hood website um, with what areas are allowed and no collection is allowed in the old made flats area for now at all. Um, as everyone's noticed, I'm sure we've had a lot of rain. Uh, mushroom hunting's been pretty good. Um, I was able to get out in the Mount Hood area recently and we found quite a lot of morels. It's kind of tapering off at this point, um, but a lot of spring king boletes. There are also butter boletes, which are edible blue staining boletes. There are bitter boletes, which are bad tasting uh, blue staining boletes. <laughs> Um, and then there are violet crown mm -hmm. cups, and I'm going to show you all a picture of what that looks like right here. So this is a photo I took of some of those violet crown cups called Sarcosphera coronaria. Um, we used to or sometimes have a mushroom of the month section, so I'm doing like a mini mushroom of the month here. Um, these things are really cool. If you blow on them, you can often get a cloud of white spore dust to come out. Um, they are cup fungi that are mycorrhizal, and often you will find them in the same areas as mountain morels. So you're, they're not necessarily going to find morels if you see them, but they are considered uh, an indicator species that you might, you might be in the right place. Um, and also, if you found morels up in the mountains, you might want to check those same areas a few weeks later um, looking for king bullets because they associate with the same sort of trees. Um, so that is all that I have, and I think we're ready to turn it over. <laughs> Thanks, Leah. I really appreciate it. Um, for those of you who don't know Leah, um, I, I'm going to say she's a recent member, but that's because I, unfortunately, I'm starting to realize I've been here quite a while, but we're so thankful to have her in our group. Uh, she joined and uh, she's just taken off with identification and getting a lot of people involved. So it's great to see the new faces in there, um, having fun, bringing new ideas to the group. And, you know, we're always looking for new members. Anybody interested, um, please go to our webpage, Oregon Mycological Society. You can find us on, uh, via Google. And, um, you know, we're a, a great group and a great bunch of people. So uh, the sky's the limit in what you're what you want to do, um, we're looking at microscopy, obviously identification, um, when we get back and, and on the ground and being able to see each other in person. Uh, we have the, the spring camps and the fall camps as well as field trips. And, um, and with that, I have one more announcement. We also have a newsletter that comes out and that is Maggie and Nick Iodanza who really take care of that. So hopefully many of the members, you just you read that. It'll come through on your email, so please click through and read it. Lots of great content on there. And just a shout out to you guys. They're always looking for articles, anything related to mushrooms, mushroom trips, anything that you find you think they might be interested and then can publish. But also any of your own stories or finding or interesting mushroom facts um, as well always happy please share your recipes because uh, uh, diversity is is wonderful so with that our speaker tonight is one of our 2019 scholarship recipients uh, she's just completed her master's degree from humboldt university under dr terry henkel 
Um, she's been working in the tropics since 2015 in Guyana, Panama, Cameroon, and Gabon. She participated in projects investigating seedling survival, seedling recruitment dynamics, ectomycorrhizal fungi, and even human-animal conflicts in Central Africa. So, uh, yeah, lucky lady, she was able to work with elephants, which is, uh, is fascinating if you ask her about it. He hopes to continue working on ectomycorrhizal relationships and how they may mitigate seedling mortality. Please welcome our speaker tonight, Carolyn Delovich. And here we go. Thanks, Carolyn. Thanks, Kim. Let me just share my screen. And... Uh, There we go. All right, looks good. Um, I'm sure you've been staring at this title, so I won't bother to read it in detail. But yeah, tonight I'm going to be talking about um, my research from my master's thesis, uh, which I conducted in Guyana, at least the majority of it, and what I'm going to be talking about today, particularly about ectomycorrhizal associations with seedlings in a very particular type of forest in the tropics. So I'm going to get started a little by talking about tropical forests and what makes them so cool. So tropical rainforests are some of the most species regions of the world. Um, there's an estimated 40 to 53,000 different tropical tree species. And so let's take, for example, just a small part of the rainforest um, a section of the Amazon. And here I have highlighted just a bit of red. So that represents a, um, a laser pointer, a one hectare area. So that's one me 100 meters by 100 meters. And within just that small space in the Amazon, you can encounter over 300 different tree species. That's a ton of tree species in just a small area. And that's kind of the up, um, the high end of the scale of species diversity, um, but it's a great example of just how impressive it is. And let's compare that, for example, I live in California, so let's compare it to California. So California is 46 million hectares in area, and within the 46 million hectares, there's only 216 native tree species. So just looking at the difference between the temperate forests that we have here in the, in, um, the west coast of the US and um, just this little piece of the Amazon, it really drives home how many species of trees there are and just how impressive that is. So a big question that a lot of ecologists have been striving to answer for a really long time is why are there so many tropical tree species? Sometimes the answer to such big questions come in small packages. In this case, seedlings. Where and how well seedlings establish and grow ultimately influences tree species diversity. So one of the leading hypotheses for why there are so many tree species has to do with the Janssen-Connell hypothesis. So this is a hypothesis proposed by two scientists independently in the early 1970s. Um, and this has to do with seedling recruitment. And when I say recruitment, I mean a seedling adding itself to an existing population of trees. Um, so that includes seed germination, uh, the survivorship of the seedling, and ultimately its growth. And so seedling recruitment is limited near same species adult trees, so ultimately near their parent trees. And this is because each tree in the tropics is thought to have a species-specific suite of plant enemies. This includes harmful bacteria, um, herbivores, invertebrates, and even pathogenic fungi. So these species-specific plant en enemies aggregate around these adult trees, and that makes it a really bad environment for seedlings. So large mature adult trees can handle this pathogen pressure because they have the resources and defenses to keep themselves alive but seedlings are pretty vulnerable and they lack these resources and strong defenses and they can't protect themselves well, um, if at all. So I'm just going to represent this figure on the left with kind of a simpler representation. So we have an adult tree and we have 
three different distances that it can recruit to um, away from the parent tree. And so this is re represented on the left on um, the x-axis. So left to right is increasing distance from parent tree. And then we're going to look at the effects of what these species species specific plant enemies have on these seedlings growth and survival. So right under the parent tree, there's really high pathogen pressure and it's ultimately not good for seedling survivorship. They're going to have very low recruitment. And that's what we're seeing here on this graph. This line represents the probability a seedling will mature. And it's basically not likely at all for it to occur right near the parent tree. And then you have these seedlings that could potentially recruit far from the parent tree. And in that case, the pathogen pressure is going to be pretty low. Those species specific enemies are not going to be in that area if an adult tree of that species isn't in that area. But the likelihood that seed rain will even reach out there to an area where there's no pathogens that are specific to this tree um, is pretty unlikely. So we have this intermediary point where um, it's best for seedling um, survival because um, while there are some of these plant enemies there, there's not as many as there is right below the tree. So it's kind of a prime area for a seedling to mature. The likelihood that a seed will reach there is pretty good and the likelihood it will survive is pretty good. So that's kind of this cross section that we see right here on the more traditional graph. I just want to talk a little bit more about how this promotes high tree species diversity. So because there's a specific area that's kind of prime for seeds or seedlings to recruit and grow in, that opens up all the space where it's not good and all the space where it's unlikely to occur for other tree species to come in. So you can imagine this scenario happening for literally every tree, almost every tree species in a mixed species forest. And that's a lot of room for other tree species to come in um, and recruit. So that's really driving um, the high, high tree species diversity in the tropics for the most part. For every rule or hypothesis, there is an exception. And there are instances throughout the tropics where a single tree species occupies a majority of the forest. So if a single tree species occupies 60% or more of a stand, it is considered a tropical monodominant tree species. And this is relatively, um, does not occur very often in the tropics. So just to um, clarify what I mean when I talk about the tropics, here is the equator and the tropics are 23 degrees north and south of the equator. So just blanked out everything else. And we have um, instances of tropical monodominant forests in almost every type of tropical forest. So we have instances in Panama, in Guyana and South America, in Cameroon and Central Africa, in Borneo and South Pacific, as well as in tropical Australia. So again, these are the forests where instead of multiple species coexisting together, like we saw that swath of the Amazon rainforest where you have 300 species coexisting, these are areas where largely a single species is representative of the forest. 60% um, or more, but sometimes it's upwards of 95% of the trees in the stand are these tropical monodominant species. And there are several traits that contribute to what makes a tropical a tree a tropical monodominant tree and what allows for such high dominance. So one of them is that these tree species tend to be mass seeders. So they have mass seeding events. Uh, this is when you have a, a big influx of seeds into the environment um, all at once. So all of those tree species in the forest will just dump a massive amount of seeds at once and you have a lot of seeds on the forest floor germinating all at once. Uh, and then you have years in between where there's basically little to no seed input. And this can be on the order of, you know, a few decades even between years where you have really substantial seed rain. 
Another common feature among these tropical monodominant tree species is that they have high seedling recruitment and survival, um, regardless, almost regardless of where they land um, after the seed rain. So on the photograph here, um, this is a representation of one of those tropical monodominant forests that we find in Guyana. This is an adult tree species and basically covering the entire floor of the forest, all of that green are seedlings of this same exact uh, tree species. So as I mentioned earlier, as I was explaining why there may be so many tropical tree species, this is something that is not really supposed to happen according to that hypothesis. It's really unusual to have all these seedlings um, around each other and around their parent tree and not immediately suffering mortality because of plants um, species specific pathogens. So the figure on the left is particularly looking at this forest on the right. Um, and it's looking at the input of seedlings and seedling survivorship um, over the series of 168 months. Um, so you see here that you have these mass seeding events where you have large influxes of seeds and resulting seedlings. And then you have these years in between where again, it's not really a substantial amount of seed input, but it's a little bit. Um, so these are the mass years um, with arrows. And you can see that there is some seedling mortality. Um, on the y-axis here, we have seedling survivorship per meter squared. And so you do see it kind of tend to decrease over time, but relative to most mixed species tropical forests and seedling mortality you would see there, this is very low, especially um, throughout the years. So this represents the high seedling survivorship and recruitment. Um, this forest in particular is the forest that I ended up doing my master's project in, um, in Northern South America in the country of Guyana. Um, luckily for me, I started my master's in the fall of 2016. I was wanting to work with seedlings because it's something that I worked on before, um, particularly um, uh, seedlings of species of trees that follow the traditional Jansen Connell hypothesis where they don't do well near their parent. Um, they do well a certain distance from them. So when I saw the forest like this, um, this is something I really wanted to get into and study and look particularly how high seedling recruitment and survival works in relation to the third common trait that we see among these tropical monodominant tree species. And that is the ectomycorrhizal or ECM habit. So many tropical monodominant trees are also ectomycorrhizal. And again, that's another kind of not common thing that you see in the tropics. Um, most trees in the tropics have arbuscular mycorrhizae. That is definitely the dominant mycorrhizal type. Um, however, these tropical monodominant species tend to have ectomycorrhizal fungi. So this is a type of mutualism in which the fungus uh, wraps around the roots of the host tree and they exchange soil nutrients to the tree and the tree in return shares sugars that it produces from photosynthesis. So on the right, I have a picture of ectomycorrhizae forming on roots of um, that study species that I just showed. So you can see right here, this brown root, that's a bare root that does not have any ectomycorrhizae on it. And then all this white here covering all of these roots is the uh, ectomycorrhizal fungus growing on um, that root tip. And this is what it looks like in cross section, the main features of that ectomycorrhizal root tip. You have the mantle and that's the part, the sheath that wraps around the root of the host plant. And then you have this mycelium or the extramatrical hyphae, and um, that's part of the fungus that goes out to the soil environment, seeking those nutrients to exchange with the tree. And you can see that that's kind of what gives this ectomycorrhizae a kind of hairy appearance. And then inside the cells or inside the root, you have the point of contact um, between the fungus and the um, tree root. And that's called the heart net. It's where the fungus is just right next to the outer cells of the root. 
Um, it doesn't enter the host route like it would in our bustular mycorrhizae. It just stays um, outside of the cell next to it, and that's where they share their nutrients. And so these ectomycorrhizal fung fungi would impart a lot of benefits to seedlings um, of these monodominant tree species, including helping with nutrient uptake, which is very important for young and vulnerable seedlings, especially because these seedlings tend to grow in very low light environments and it's difficult for them to photosynthesize themselves. And then there's the potential as well for adult tree adults trees to network through the ectomycorrhizae to their seedlings so that they can share directly a network of their sugars that they can produce through photosynthesis to their seedlings, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. So again, this is uh, some of the, these are some of the cases of tropical monodominance um, throughout the tropics. Um, really found throughout, but there's not many situations where it does occur. And so today I'm going to be focusing on one particular instance where I did my field research, and that's in Northern South America in the country of Guyana. And the species I'm particularly of tree that I'm particularly going to be talking about is the Siambi corymbosa. It's in the family of Fabaceae and the subfamily Deterioidae. And it has each of these um, three common traits of ectomycorrhizal trees that I was talking about. Um, it masks seeds. It has high seedling recruitment and survival. Uh, I showed that in the figure earlier. And it also is ectomycorrhizal. So just show you a bit how dominant it is on this figure in the lower right. Um, it's just a representation of all the places where you have these monodominant forests of Dysimbi corymbosa. So the white represents um, mixed species forests, and by that I mean just areas where you have many tree species coexisting and not one of them strongly dominates as much as um, the other. Um, and then these dark areas are areas where Dysimbi corymbosa is dominant. So you can see all throughout here and here and just really scattered throughout. Um, this is one kilometer, the scale. So that just kind of gives you an idea of um, the area that you can find this forest in. And so what I'm particularly interested in is looking um, at connecting these two traits of high seedling recruitment and survival and the ectomycorrhizal habit um, I want to look at the seedlings uh, that recruited in 2016 and see what features of the ectomycorrhizal symbiosis might be promoting such high seedling survivorship that we do see in these seedlings. I just think it's incredibly important to do this, especially because it is such an anomaly in tropical forests to have not only a tree that is this dominant, but seedlings that have such high survivorship amid all the pressures of being a young seedling in um, a tropical forest. And the survival and growth of these seedlings is so important because they are what maintains these persistent monodominant forests. So these are not forests that take advantage of a gap opening and grow and maybe they dominate for you know, the lifespan of the tree. These are ones that persist over and over again. These are, you know, hundreds of years old forests and they continue to persist because they have such a substantial seedling bank. So again, you can see all of this green on the forest floor are uh, seedlings of Dysimbi corymbosa with um, some adults here and there. And so as soon as one of those adults dies and tips over and a light gap opens, instead of opportunistic species coming in and taking over and possibly threatening um, the integrity of this monodominant forest, you have these seedlings ready to go. And um, as soon as that light gap's open, they shoot up and they work to maintain these monodominant forests. And so I think looking at what makes these seedlings survive so well, especially in relation to their ectomycorrhizal mutualists, is very important in studying tropical monodominance um, on, as a whole. 
And so these are the specific research questions that I sought um, to address during my master's thesis. First, how does the diversity of ECM fungi change over time in a seedling? Does the extent that seedlings are colonized by ECM fungi also increase over time? So how much of the root system of seedlings is colonized by ECM fungi? Are there spatial or temporal influences on seedling ECM community structure? And lastly, how do seedling ECM fungal communities compare to ECM fungal communities that we see on nearby adult trees? So to address these questions, I collected a bunch of seedlings. Um, I did this at three time series so that we could kind of look at changes over time. So we collected at less than one month, so two to three weeks post germination. This is an example of what they look like at that age. Um, some of them don't even have true leaves yet, um, but they have small burgeoning root systems and those already are going to have ectomycorrhizae on it, which is crazy if you ask me. Um, and then at six months, and we also collected at 12 months. So we collected 30 seedlings at each time from our seven collection sites or collection plots. Um, and then ultimately wanted to look at the different features of the ECM symbiosis um, on these seedlings. So first I'm gonna talk about what I found in terms of the diversity of ECM fungal symbionts, and that's on a per seedling basis and also um, based on the seedling age class, those three age classes. Then I'll look at the physical characteristics of the uh, symbiosis. So how much of the root systems get colonized. And then I will talk about the changes in ECM fungal communities. Um, that's between seedling age classes, among those seven collection plots, and lastly, between our seedlings and um, adult collections from a previous study. But ultimately, we will see that seedlings are important reservoirs of ECM fungal community diversity in these um, Dysimbe corombosa monodominant forests. All right, um, now to talk about the diversity of ECM fungal symbionts. But before I do that, I just want to get a little bit into uh, the methodology of how we even tell what's there. So this is a cool picture on the right. This is a photo I took of one of our um, ectomycorrhizae I, we recovered from the study. This was actually, um, yeah, it was one of the most commonly collected ones. This is a tomentella. Um, you can see it has very dark color. The mantle is dark brown, almost black. And then um, I think it's really cool to see these extramatrical hyphae coming off of it. Um, yeah, that's a very distinct one um, for sure. And I've seen it thousands of times now <laughs> through my data analysis, but I'll get into how we can tell it's there. So um, I conducted a method called morphotyping. So basically when you're morphotyping, you take all the roots of the seedling, um, you cut it from the main axes, you want only the fine roots where, um, where they're able to be colonized by ECM fungi. And then just looking under a dis dissecting microscope, um, looking for visual differences between root tips that have ECM fungi on them. Um, usually you can pick out differences in color for sure. Um, and then other less distinct things like hyphal arrangement, um, you know, presence or absence of extramatrical hyphae and what that looks like. Um, you know, you can have really long extramatrical hyphae like this, or you can have something that's much shorter and looks kind of um, spiky. So there's a lot of variation that you can detect visually. And so that's what I mean when I talk about morphotyping, that's visually distinguishing between different ECM fungi on the roots of these host seedlings. So through morphotyping a seedling, I did one of two things with the root tip samples. I did individual collections, so for each age class, every time I found a new morphotype I hadn't seen for that age class, I would single out that morphotype and collect it individually um, and set it aside for DNA sequencing later. 
And what I also did was every time looking at an individual seedling, every time I saw a morphotype I hadn't seen on that seedling yet, I would take that morphotype and I would put it in a collection to bolt together with all of the root tips that I found in that particular plot. Um, so this is kind of um, a more general collection. So just taking everything new per seedling, um, putting it together and giving kind of more generalized look at what we're seeing for each plot in each time series. So regardless of um, how I collected them, we amplified the ITS region. Um, that's the internal transcribed space region of DNA and that's commonly used as um, a fungal barcode. And then for my individual collections, I carried out Sanger sequencing. And for these bulk collections, I did Illumina next generation sequencing. And ultimately what it, that gives us is a series of sequences. Um, and you can plug that into a database, a public database online. And that gives you an operational taxonomic unit, which I'll refer to as an OTU. Um, so OTUs can be species if your sequence matches to something that's defined as a species, or it can be, you know, a genus. Uh, it can even just be a family if that's as specific as it can be assigned. Um, it's really useful for um, revealing relationships among um, same genus species and closely related genera. Um, so that's ultimately what we get on the end of there. So the OTUs is our what ends up being there. And we do that ultimately beginning through, through morphotyping. All right, back at this. So we're looking at the diversity of ESAM fungal symbionts on a per seedling basis. Um, and this is just, you know, how many different morphotypes did I find per seedling? So I predicted that the number of ECM fungal morphotypes would increase over time. Um, that was my idea because the longer that a seedling is in soil, the longer they're exposed to, you know, ECM fungal inoculum in the soil. So the more exposure, um, I predicted that they would accumulate more and more ECM fungi over time. And in fact, that is what we saw in terms of the number of morphotypes per seedling. So on the x-axis, we have seedling age um, less than one month, six month, 12 month, and then lastly, it's just all age classes combined. And then on the y-axis, we have the number of ECM fungal morphotypes per seedling. So how many distinct ECM root tips did I find for every seedling I looked at? And so at less than one month, um, there was an average of 1.2 morphotypes per seedling. At six months, there was 3.2 morphotypes per seedling on average. And at 12 months, there was 3.6 morphotypes per seedling on average. And now look at this, let's look at this diversity per age class. Um, so for the same reason why I thought there would be more ECM morphotypes per seedling over time, um, I also predicted that there would be more ECM fungal species and um, seedlings over time. More exposure to whatever inocula is in the soil and that they would just kind of keep aggregating for as much as they can. Um, so when we're looking at these results, we're talking um, specifically at the sequences we get from morphotyping. And this is what we find in terms of fungal species richness or the number of species. Um, just to clarify, I am showing both the morphotyping sequencing and the bulk root tip sequencing. So those are the two different methods that I, sh I showed um, on that flowchart. So at less than one month, we're finding five to six individual OTUs um, for that seedling age class. So that's for all of those 210 seedlings. Um, at six months, we're finding 22 to 26 OTUs um, for six month old seedlings. And lastly, at 12 months, we're finding anywhere from 17 to 114 OTUs for that age class. 
So I want to talk a little bit about the difference between these morphotyping um, sequences and these root tip bulking sequences. Um, the difference in methods isn't so glaring when you look at one month and six months, but you get to 12 months and those are radically different results for essentially the similar collection methods. Um, and I think this likely has to do with um, just the extent that a human can differentiate between, you know, two things. Um, the reason I believe that I only got 17 OTUs at 12 months is because I could only distinguish 17 different looking um, ectomycorrhizal root tips. And so it was limited by what I believe to look different as opposed to this root tip bulking. Um, it's more like putting everything in there. Um, there was a lot more root tips in that sample. Um, it eliminates the possibility that two root tips that look extremely similar would only be sampled once, which is likely the case of what happened here. Um, so I think the root tip bulking really represents more of what is actually there in terms of the number of species. And I think the morphotyping alone really limits um, how much diversity is actually there to um, you know, what we perceive as there. Um, which is surprising, especially because a lot of studies do rely just on this morphotyping. And um, I think it really underestimates um, species diversity on any kind of root tip that you're doing a study on. Um, the Illumina sequencing used for root tip bulking also is much more sensitive. Um, and so it is likely to detect more regardless of, you know, whether you collected more root tips um, than you did for Sanger sequencing. So it is also a more sensitive method. So I think takeaway from this is, um, you know, paying more attention to uh, the italicized numbers because I think that is capturing a lot more of what's actually there than the non-italicized numbers. Okay, um, and then we're gonna look at what showed up from morphotyping or the Sanger sequencing, and then what showed up from our bulk root tip sequencing. Um, so this is based on morphotyping, so our Sanger sequencing. And so the y-axis or x-axis, we have ECM fungal lineages, um, and the y-axis, we have the number of OTUs. So I was just grouping together by lineage. It kind of simplifies things a little bit more. And then the number of OTUs, so how many of our sequences fell into these lineages? And this is divided as well by seedling age. Um, the darker color is the younger seedling and is lighter. the lighter it gets, the older the seedling. So we can see based on morphotyping, the most commonly collected lineages were, first of all, clavulina and Tomentella telephora, followed by the Russia lactarius clade, and lastly, tied for third was Boletus and Inosibi um, were the third most commonly collected um, ECM fungal lineage according to morphotyping. And this is what uh, our results look like from root tip bulking or that Illumina sequencing, which tends to um, detect more species. So axes are the same, ECM fungal lineage on the x-axis and number of OTUs on the y. And you can see there are a lot more ECM fungal lineages represented. And um, the ones that were most commonly collected were different as well from what we found from um, Sanger or morphotyping. So Russia lactarius was the most represented, followed by Tomatella telephora. And lastly, Boletus and Sabacina were we're both represented equally in third place. So just looking at them side by side, like I said, you can see different representation of common lineages. For example, Clavulina was one of the most commonly collected um, lineages based on our morphotyping. But then you look over at a root tip bulking and um, Clavulina is quite down the line and um, at fourth most commonly collected. 
And beyond that, some lineages are not even represented based on this morphotyping strategy, um, such as Ammonita, which is here from root tip bulking and Portinarius, which is here. Completely absent based on the morphotyping alone. Um, so again, I, I think this just shows how sensitive this Illumina sequencing is that we do um, from the root tip bulking and just how your collection and sequencing method can vastly change what you observe to be there, which I think is really interesting and important going forward. Okay, next we'll look at the physical characteristics of the symbiosis and we're going to look at um, percent colonization of ECM fungi on roots of seedlings. So I predicted that the ECM fungal colonization extent on seedling roots will increase as a seedling ages. Again, kind of for the same reason, um, these seedlings are in soil longer. Um, they have more exposure to whatever ECM fungi are in the soil. Um, and given that these are beneficial root symbiotic fungi, I would think that the more you have, the better off you are. However, this is not something that we saw over time. So percent colonization did not increase over time. So on the x-axis, we have seeding age, y-axis, we have percent colonization on a scale of zero to 100. And we saw that um, percent colonization was highest at six months. Um, significantly higher than at one or 12 months. And there was no difference in percent colonization between these very young two to three week old seedlings that I showed earlier, some of which didn't even have leaves yet, uh, and these fully developed, you know, foot tall, 12 month old seedlings, which I thought was very interesting. Okay, let's look at changes in ECM fungal communities, and we'll start with. Um, changes between seedling age classes. And so I say between seedling age classes because um, I wasn't able to compare with the two to three week old seedlings. Um, I personally was not there to collect them. Um, and going forward, I was collecting by plot, um, having things separated, separated out a little bit kind of helps later on with data analysis. Um, so I'm just going to be showing differences between the six and the 12 month old seedlings. So I predicted that ECM fungal communities on six month old seedlings would be similar to those on 12 month old seedlings. Um, and this was because I figured that those ECM fungi that are in the environment at six months are likely to be the same ones that are there at 12 months. Um, as I showed earlier, I, ex I expected it to, the seedlings to accumulate ECM fungi over time, but I didn't expect the composition to necessarily change. Um, you know, the ones that you see at six months, I would expect to still be there at 12 months um, with the addition of more species. However, that's not what we saw. So communities were significantly different at six months and at 12 months. So this figure is an ordination and how you interpret it is those points that are closer together and cluster are more similar than um, points that are further apart. And so the triangles are six month old seedling ECM fungal communities and um, circles are at 12 months. Um, and so we are seeing some grouping um, at the six month level and grouping among the 12 month um, data points. And what this shows us is um, that because they cluster apart, that they are significantly different. And this is followed by a statistical um, method um, that allows us to be able to tell mathematically that these are significantly different, and they are. And it also calculated uh, species turnover beta diversity of um, ECM fungal communities at six and 12 months. Um, and there was very high species turnover, much higher than I expected. Um, I show a range here because uh, the lower end of the range is using just the morphotyping data, and then the higher end of the range at 0.9 is using the Illumina sequence data. So regardless, this is, this is a really high amount of turnover. Um, how you can interpret this um, simply is 
80% of the species that you see at six months are gone by 12 months and you have almost a completely different community, which um, was very surprising to me, um, to say the least, um, not what I expected. And then let's look at um, changes among the seven sampling plots. So I expected there to be some difference um, in the ECM fungal communities among the sampling plots, um, especially because our sampling plots are situated within a five um, kilometer circumference of our base camp. So you have some that are pretty close together. You have some that are like two and a half kilometers apart. So that's a pretty substantial you know, spatial difference. Um, aside from that, there's different soil types, there's different elevations, um, there's different soil moistures and nutrient contents. Um, and while the nutrient contents don't vary very much, I mean, they could affect the ECM fungal communities. And we also do see in sporocarp collections that certain species tend to, tend to um, have an affinity for certain areas. So it would make sense that their mycorrhizae would as well. But we did not see any significant difference uh, among the ECM fungal communities based on plot. And species turnover among the plots at each time was relatively low. So at six months, uh, it was 0.2, like 20% of the species would change among the plots. And that's a similar number to what we saw at 12 months. So there's really no spatial effect that I detected of ECM fungal community composition, both within a time and, and across um, uh, seeding age classes. And lastly, we'll look at changes between seedlings and adults. Um, I definitely anticipated that seedling ECM fungal communities would be similar um, to adult decorumbosa fungal communities. And that relates back to something I touched on before about mycorrhizal networking. So there's a potential for formation of common mycorrhizal networks, and that's where an adult tree um, can essentially link up with um, their seedlings and through their mycorrhizae and able to share nutrients that way. So an adult tree can help their offspring um, through these networks of ECM fungi, which I think is a really cool area of study. Um, I would like to get into that um, more in the future. But um, so in order for this to happen, of course, they would have to have some shared species. You know, if you find that they have shared species, that in no way shows that they're networking. But if they don't share any species, I think you can pretty much conclude that there could not be any networking um, if you follow that. So this is what we found between seedlings and adults. Um, so this figure here is a heat map. So on the x-axis, which is actually at the top, I have the three different ages of decorumbosa. So we have six months on the left, 12 months in the middle, and the right is the adults. Um, and then down the y-axis, we have ECM fungal O2U. So I took the 26 most commonly collected ECM fungi from each of those age classes and just looked at how much overlap there was, not only between the seedling age classes, but also between seedlings and adults. Um, and these adult data were collected um, by Smith et al. in 2016, and they were collected in the same forest that I collected the seedlings, but they were collected at a different time than I collected the seedlings. And we're seeing that there's only seven instances where an OTU recovered from seedlings was also found um, to be commonly encountered in adults. And even more so, there's only two instances where an OTU was covered in all um, of the instances, so both seedling age classes and adults. So those examples, or those two instances are Rushla Mermeca Broma, as well as Tomatella ECM 1111. And that's the ECM fungus that I showed you before with the um, dark extramatrical hyphae. So that was um, 
pretty unexpected for sure. Uh, I, I expected much more overlap. Um, but after I realized that there was such high species turnover over time, it's almost I mean, in the span of six months, as we saw with six month old seedlings and 12 month old seedlings, it it shows me also that there is something to that, especially because these adults were collected in 2016. Um, these six month old seedlings were collected a year later and then 12 month old seedlings even six months after that. So it seems like there is a lot of turnover happening over time. Um, that's in addition to the fact that um, these adult ECM fungi were collected in a different manner than I collected mine. Obviously, I could take the whole root system of a seedling or as much as I could get out of the ground and look at every um, root tip that I had on that seedling. Um, but when you're looking at adult trees, you can't just pull an adult tree out of the ground and look at every root on the tree. So, you know, the sampling effort is, is, is different um, for adults uh, than it is for seedlings. Um, and they ended up selecting a certain amount of good looking ECM root tips. Um, and so the collection methods are different and that can definitely account for differences that we saw in um, what species are represented and also how many species are recovered. Um, for example, from this adult study, they found 97 different OTUs. And as you might recall from earlier, we found 114 OTUs on 12 month old seedlings. So that's not to say that 12 month old seedlings have more ECM fungi than adult trees, but I think it does drive home the message that um, ECM or that seedlings are really important reservoirs of ECM fungal diversity. So just in summary, diversity of ECM fungal symbionts, um, going through all of these on a per seedling basis, um, ECM diversity does increase over time. And then per age class, the number of species also does increase over time. There is no temporal effect of ECM, the extent of colonization by ECM fungi. That's where we saw um, it was significantly higher at six months, but that there was no pattern over time. And then between seedling age classes, there is a significant difference in community composition. Um, there's no difference in community composition um, among sampling plots. And lastly, there's little overlap in common species between seedlings and adults. But again, I think there's um, a lot to unpack there. And I think that's a really interesting study. Um, I would love to sample adult um, and seedlings in a similar fashion. And also at the same time, in case we are detecting some kind of um, species turnover that happens even in the span of six months. Um, so that's a cool direction to go to. But ultimately, the take home message is seedlings are important reservoirs of ECM fungal community diversity in these assigned being monodominant forests. Um, and with that, I would just like to thank a lot of people. <laughs> I have my collaborators at Purdue University, Dr. Cook and Dr. Aim, um, our field crew down in Guyana who helped a lot with. Um, collecting seedlings, um, my thesis committee at Humboldt State, and then all these funding sources, both to um, collaborators and to me, particularly Oregon Mycological Society. Um, thanks for having me today, and um, hopefully I can answer some questions or try to. Thank you. Thanks, Carolyn. That's a, that is a lot to unpack. <laughs> uh, I definitely on that one. Um, so Leah had the first question. She was asking that uh, is the ratio of sapropytic to ECM uh, mushroom forming fungi in tropical areas versus our areas? So uh, she's curious about the availability of nutrients due to fast nutrient cycling from the soil. Or, uh -huh. So, you know, um, I'm assuming that the where you studied, it was a nutrient poor system. Yeah, definitely important phosphorus. That's the limiting nutrient. Um, okay in all tropical forests, essentially. Um, yeah, so we don't really have good comparisons of what saprotrophic fungi are there. Um, okay. One of our collaborators, um, Dr. Aim here, um, she's working to put that together. So we do have some kind of comparison, 
but largely when they go down there to do sporocarp collections, it's like, you know, tunnel vision, ECM fungi only. Okay. Um, so I can't say for sure um, what that looks like. Um, and honestly, I'm not sure what that ratio looks like in temperate forests, to be honest. So even if I knew what it was there, I'd, <laughs> I couldn't really comment on that. Um, but hopefully that's an up and coming thing that, um, you know, we'll be able to look at later. Um, but honestly, we're so inundated with so many different new undefined species that we get of ectomycorrhizal fungi that I think the sap robes have like kind of fallen by the wayside a little bit. Okay, thanks on that one. The next question is from Swan and she's asking, does colonization by different ECM fungi affect the growth of seedlings? Ah, I have a slide for that. Hey. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't really have time to talk about this too much, but there are a lot of, or not a lot, I wish there were more studies um, that look at colonizing seedlings with different ECM fungi and kind of seeing who's a better mutualist. Um, and there's definitely a spectrum. I think in all mutualisms between, you know, a true mutualist and even going back to a parasitism. Um, I can't speak specifically for the fungi that we have in Guyana that I recovered, but um, you can look at this figure here. So basically some ECM fungi are better mutualists than others. Um, so this figure is a little small, but this is from NARA et al. Um, they were studying um, a salic species in Japan. Mm -hmm. And they inoculated them with seven different, or no, 11 different ECM species. So just a monoculture, um, you know, one seedling, one ECM fungal species. And he measured different things. He measured on the bottom um, phosphorus content, nitrogen content, and then finally dry weight of the seedling. So just metrics of how well it did. You know, you want high P and N content. And also, you know, you want to be heavy. So you're looking for things higher on these scales. So... On the left in these figures, that's the control. That's where they didn't add any ectomycorrhizal fungi. And then um, you see the 11 different ECM fungi going to the right of that. And so something like this, that's a little shaky. So that's, um, let me see, that's a Hebaloma leucosarx. Um, that's doing really well as a mutualist. Um, it's, it's improving nitrogen content relative to this control. Um, P content as well as seedling dry weight. But then you have other ECM fungi like this. What is this? A Lacaria amethystina. Um, and it's really not performing better than the control, which is having no ECM, um, which is pretty surprising. So, I mean, you can kind of tell from this figure, even out of just these 11 species, that there's a lot of variation in how well in ECM fungus will do as a mutualist. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, that's a, that's a great answer for that. <laughs> I know, it so is. that someone asked. <laughs> um, next question, uh, Dylan is, uh, is asking again, he says the percent colonization is based on mass or percent of the surface area. And he was asking is, did he miss some clarification on that? Um, no, I did not go into detail. Um, Thought it'd be too boring, but I will tell you now. <laughs> so for each seedling root system, I um, cut off the fine roots. So those are the roots that are going to be colonized if they will be colonized. Mm -hmm. um, cut them into, I think, five millimeter sections. Um, and then I had a Petri dish and it had a grid system on it. So you put the root tips in the water, you swirl them around, and then you look at their, them under a dissecting microscope. And then you go through and you scan the X axes of those lines on the Petri dish and the Y axes on those lines of the Petri dish. And every time you had a root intersect one of those lines, you scored it as either ECM or non ECM. So ultimately you come up with number of root tips that did not have ECM and then a number of root tips that did have ECM. And then you make a percentage out of that. So that's how I calculated percent mycorrhizae, mycorrhization. Um, Okay. Yeah. Oh, th thank you on that one. And he also had another question. He said, were the sample plots unique in ECM fungi or were they homogeneous? 
So that's going back to that ordination where we just saw a bunch of overlap. Um, so it didn't seem like the ECM fungal communities were very specific to the um, sampling plot. Um, and I think I'd be interested more to also look at the sporocarp collections because these plots were originally to sample sporocarps and it's been done, you know, at least for 10 years, maybe more in a okay. row. Um, so we have a really good idea mm -hmm. of what ECM fungi are represented, at least in terms of sporocarps in those plots. And I think there is some specialization based on where they are, but I was not finding that with root tips. Um, and I don't want to say for sure for the sporocarps, because like I said, I, I don't know that information specifically off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I didn't detect any, any particular preference for plot of any um, of the OTUs that were covered. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, so just in general, what was the most surprising finding that, that you had? Something that jumped out that uh, you didn't expect or, you know, and I think I heard this, that you want to, you want to research further. Yeah, I think it was definitely just, um, you know, how, how dynamic these communities are and just how they appear to be ever changing over the matter of months. Um, that's really surprising, especially, you know, you go to these forests and they largely look exactly the same because you have, you know, a bunch of tree species that are exactly the same. And it's kind of cool to think about the fact that under your feet, they're constantly, you know, changing their composition of ECM fungi. And um, I would really like to look at that more um, these temporal changes in ECM fungal communities, you know, not only on seedlings, but adults. Um, cause yeah, I think that's something I really didn't expect and maybe looking at some of the causes. Um, I know some people have studied, um, changes in ECM fungal communities related to, um, influxes of phosphorus and, and nitrogen into the environment, which can increase, oh. increase um, ECM species diversity. Um, but yeah, I mean, cause that's, that's a whole thing that you can get into for sure. And I'm not finding too much research in regards to that, um, in the tropics in particular. Um, but it's something I really didn't expect. Um, and I think could really warrant a lot more research into that for sure. Okay. So, um, I'm going to hit you with something here. My background is more into the ecology and forest ecology. Mm -hmm. So, my questions come from it. Um, so I'm interested to see these these monotypes, and yeah. the fact that you do not have, uh, in the in the typical sense, the competition with the the younger seedlings. Are you seeing this as a a strategy, not at the individual survival level, but as the species survival level against the uh, versus the um, uh, you know, diverse forests. So I'm, I guess I'm asking, are these trees somehow protecting their young and uh, um, nurturing them in a way that when a gap forms, that that these that their young are the only ones there, and especially what's going on at the edges of these uh, these forests, mm -hmm. these mono forests and the diverse species forests. Yeah. Um, so. I think a key component of these forests is, is that they are ectomycorrhizal um, and they're surrounded by our buscular mycorrhizal forests. And in general, our um, ectomycorrhizal fungi are better at nutrient cycling than our buscular mycorrhizae. So that might help them exclude our buscular mycorrhizal trees from there, who just kind of can't keep up in a sense. Um, so I think that component really helps. Um, I, I don't know if I want to speak too much on whether they, they're, you know, assign anything altruistic to it. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I like to think that I like to think they're kind of together for the common good, you know, keep this, you know, species going, keep our dominance levels up. Um, but I think it's just kind of a result of the traits that I talked about before, like the mass seeding. Um, the ectomycorrhizal habit, um, and then the resulting high seedling survival. 
And then in terms of the edges, that is something I'm also interested in. Um, it's kind of hard to tell exactly where an edge is. It's a little more of a tapering off rather than like, you know, a bunch of dysimbi and then all of a sudden mixed species forests. Um, yeah, I think in that respect, it is more of a competition on the edges of what's going to win out. Is it going to be who can cycle the nutrients better? Is it going to be who has the most offspring right here that's going to eliminate um, resources and areas for the mixed species trees to get in? Um, but in terms of the edges, that's something I wanted to look at as well of seeing how seeming survival is going to operate on those edges. Like, to what extent are we seeing the traditional seedling mortality where they mass seed, but then they all die because they're on the edge and they don't have as much of the benefit as you would have if you're surrounded completely by other ectomycorrhizal trees. Um, so, okay, that, that works. <laughs> Always fun to look at competition. Um, <laughs> we have another question from Heidi. She says, can you talk more about the two methods of analysis, morphology and bulk? And, uh, and also, if the bulk is so much more accurate, why do the morphology study? Yeah, let me um, bring up that slide. Yeah, this, this I'm having trouble communicating it in a way that's very easy to understand. <laughs> um, so I'm happy to talk about it again. Um, so... I didn't know going in that morphotyping would be so undependable, <laughs> the individual collection. Um, that was kind of something I was curious about also, and it was something simple to do at the moment. So I decided to do both. Um, the reason that I did these individual collections in the first place is because that's the only way I could tell what was on each individual seedling in terms of um, some kind of metric of diversity or species richness per seedling. Um, Cause that way I, I had a visual database with pictures and um, codes of like, okay, this is the brown hairy one or whatever. And so I could look at a seedling and be like, okay, I see this morphotype, this morphotype, and this morphotype. This seedling has three morphotypes. And so that's essentially for me, okay, this the seedling has at least three different ECM fungi on it. I, I don't, I can't say for sure what they are or that it's only three, but it kind of gives me some idea of on a per seedling basis, how many ECM fungi there are. It's kind of an estimate. Um, so that's why I want to do the individual collections. So I had an idea on a per seedling basis, what um, species richness look like, or in this sense, morphotype richness. And then the bulk collection was kind of a safety net for this technique. It was supposed to just capture anything I was going to miss. Um, I just realized the likelihood of me being able to distinguish every single morphotype and pick out every species that was there was, you know, very slim. <laughs> so doing this bulk collection, it was a way for me to capture any diversity I would have mixed, missed from um, this individual morphotyping alone. Okay. I just didn't anticipate that not only would the bulk collection collect so many more, but it would also collect different species. And I didn't touch on this very much, but um, the individual collection of the morphotypes also showed species that weren't um, recovered from this alumina bulk sequencing. Um, huh. You know, the different sequencing platforms are going to reveal different species as well because they have different sensitivities. Um, you know, that's a whole different thing that I don't think I could get into if I wanted to. But so that's why I did individual collection. Um, and I, I had no idea that it would be not very effective in the long term. So um, probably I would not do that again. Um, but I think it was it was cool to show how different it could be based on how you collect your root tips. Okay, well, that, that definitely your answer definitely sounds like you may have had that at your thesis defense. I don't know. It sounds like it to me. I can't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, so also, I'm, I'm interested. To, obviously, this forest is a gap formation forest. And did you specifically, probably not, sample the uh, ECM species 
on individuals that were maybe in those gaps and growing versus those that, that weren't and if they were different? So there actually aren't very many gaps in this forest. Okay. Um, and there's a few reasons for that. One is because they always have seedlings right there. As soon as they get that sunlight, they shoot up really quickly. Um, you know, before those early successional species can get in and establish themselves, you know, because that's what those tree species are basically meant to do. So this monodominant tree species is ready for that. And um, something else I didn't talk about, about a particular feature of the tree is that it has coppicing um, roots or branches that will shoot up from the tree. So where's a picture of the tree? Even if a seedling doesn't take over, the tree itself will take over a gap. Um, you can kind of see in this picture. So this is what the tree looks like. And this is um, those coppicing branches. Um, oh, it essentially okay. forms a pseudo trunk of all these different branches forming. It's and similar is, to a fig tree, correct? Yeah. Tree growth? Okay. Yeah, in a sense. Um, and so when you're getting a gap, it's either one of these adult trees will grow into it really quickly or in the event that there's um an adult tree that's not close enough to close that gap um a seedling will grow into it um okay that sounds good and i guess uh, i guess go ahead and and if we'll test you on this one can you define what a gap forest is um so i i, I don't know if i heard the term gap forest i know what a forest or gap is the gap um, formation versus fire versus oh yeah i mean i know a bit about um gap formation because working in panama we were studying um i don't know if you use the term pioneer species but those species that colonize gaps and take over so um talking about gap formation it's from basically tree fall or any other kind of disturbance that opens up a light gap in the forest um, and exposes the forest floor to a lot more heat and light. Um, and then, you know, the early successional tree species come in and, and take over. Okay, yeah, Leah had that question. Um, there's different forest uh, um, regeneration, um, oh, I forget the term, but anyway, there's, there's mm -hmm. fire-driven forests and those are things like the boreal forest, some of the forests that we have here in the Pacific Northwest. And then there's gap formation forests, which means they don't have one large destructive event, but old trees die and fall over and then other species mm. take over. So that's just the difference um, for uh, some of the people that are being okay. in that one, so. I think as someone who studies primarily in the tropics, it's almost all it's a given, gap yeah. forest. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, you know, my brain is not even thinking about uh, other possibilities that happen in many other parts of the world. Nope. And then um, can you also just talk a little bit about what are uh, uh, coppicing branches? Um, yeah, I can talk a little bit about that. So I wish I could zoom in a little bit. But anyways, um, anytime a opportunity like a light gap comes in for these tree species, um, they will sprout um, a branch coming off of it. Um, you can kind of see one here. So they just kind of, how do I describe this? <laughs> I would say they just, well, they almost mutate because Doug firs would never do something like that here. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot of trees that don't do this. Um, most trees don't do this. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's like almost, um, I don't want to say spontaneous, but they can they can grow from a lot of different places on the tree and sprout up when um, they need to replace themselves. Essentially, you can see it sometimes on the base of fruit trees. I don't know if like physiologically it's the same thing, um, but yeah, I don't know how to go into detail about that because I don't really know um, anatomically what they are or where they're coming from. <laughs> It's definitely it's definitely something that is unique to the tropics. I think the closest thing that we have uh, that I have seen, and that's down in Florida, is the strangler the strangler figs. Strangler figs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
and they'll yeah. they'll grow out. So it's almost like the tree doesn't want to give up; it wants to to take that gap and uh, um, exactly, and yeah, the nutrients and everything. So it's just a constantly expanding tree, and it's it's pretty interesting because you know there's probably parts of it that are hundreds of years old. There's parts of it that's tens of years old, and you can have things in the center dying. And you immediately have another part of the tree coming to life to replace it, which, um, yeah, it's it's really cool. It's interesting. And I wish I had a picture of some of the bigger ones um, because you can climb into these really easily. Like this is a relatively small one, if you ask me. <laughs> like wow. there's one you can climb into and you're like 20 feet in the air. And it's just like a nice little little nest up there that you can fit like three or four people. Um, yeah, they're they're great for climbing. <laughs> I can't say exactly what pop seed stems are then I can at least say that they're really good trees to climb well uh you know we're proud to have uh, been able to support some of this research and I guess we ask what uh, what are you thinking next oh yeah I mean it's really hard to figure out even what I'm doing tomorrow these days but um <laughs> I, I thinking more on it I think I definitely want to get more education um you know, I've, the likelihood of me going through um, a career in academia, I mean, that's a very hard career to bust into, but I would be excited to pursue an PhD um, just for the skills I would get, kind of do more focus on molecular techniques, because I think that's really applicable to not only a lot of different areas of mycology, but a lot of different areas of science. Um, so kind of, I, I would love to keep working on this and kind of doing the PhD pathway seems like the most likely way to keep getting out in the field and keep, you know, getting dirty. <laughs> okay, now we have one last question before we uh, we close this out. It's from Leah and she was asking, uh, what ECM mushrooms were fruiting uh, during the study? <laughs> I don't know if I can answer that. Um, so I went there um, two different times. Um, this was a really like rapid get in, get out thing. Um, I actually did the collection in, in 10 days each time. Um, wow. So if I wasn't looking at a seedling, um, I was looking at a root system. And unfortunately, I wasn't looking at anything else. <laughs> um, so I can't say for sure. Um, it's kind of a blur and um, unfortunately I didn't have very much time to actually walk around and and look at what was there, um, especially because it wasn't a trip where we were doing any kind of sporocarp survey. It was really exclusively to go check on our seedlings. So unfortunately I can't say anything about that, but hopefully when I go back I'll let you know. <laughs> Well, we're, we're going to look forward to you. We hope to have you as a speaker again in the future. And uh, I think that's all for tonight. Uh, Carolyn, just hang on and we'll talk after this. Cool. Um, just a reminder, there is no meeting in July, but please join us in August. Again, the speaker is going to be Danny Miller, and he'll be talking about his matchmaker mushroom ID uh, software. So thanks so much. You guys all take care, and we will see you in August.